about the most, and that's what they should care about the most is their own self-interest and which of these presidents are going to make their lives better. And I think, you know, they don't have to like Trump. They have to like how the country was and how their lives were under a Trump Let presidency. Let me ask you a very specific question. As, uh, as sincere Rachel Maddow's uh, most... It's a kind of old traditional way of looking at things, but I think for me it matters. Like, I think once you vote for a, a, a candidate, you feel a responsibility to vindicate that even subconsciously. Mm. You know, I live in Brazil as well. I live that distance that I can maintain, you know, not just geographic, but just kind of like emotional and psychological. I, I think it's a very important one to maintain my independence. When's um, the last time you voted? I uh, haven't voted since I became a journalist, for example. Do you think reason. most journalists should just not vote, sit these things out, and just be a journalist? I mean, I think what most journalists should do is maintain a spirit of independence. And, like, whether these people vote or not because of that old, they're obviously Democrats. And what amazes me is that there used to be a requirement that they pretend more. Now, you, right. they don't pretend any longer. Right. They're I, I don't mean the op-ed page people. I mean, like, the actual reporters right. sit on Twitter all day. Explicit because I talk about professionally. I just want to hang out and relax in North Korea. And they start just for some reason they have this spontaneous need to tell me everything that they know about North Korea. It's like it's okay that you know nothing. This is not, you know, how what, what are the colors of the street light? This is the most cryptic hidden country on earth. I wrote the book. Fine. There's so much out there to learn. No question about it. So, Michael, give me your uh, philosophy. Let me say I'm an tell me, tell me your core. Like, I believe in this. I don't believe in this. I believe in this. I believe in this. Just kind of walk me through it. Okay, anarchism can be reduced to one sentence. Yeah. You do not speak. You do not speak for me. Everything else is application. Okay, so that's the, there, there's your your elevator pitch answer in one. Until she figures out a Resident Evil style puzzle that reveals a generic, mysterious movie prop that's actually the map. But then a bunch of battle droids show up and challenge her to a fight instead of, you know, shooting her. Because I'm pretty sure they could eventually overwhelm her with superior firepower, but whatever. She beats the shit out of most of them and the survivors activate a self-destruct device to try and take her out. But it's okay because they literally warn her that they're about to do it and it takes about 15 minutes for them to actually detonate, so she's got plenty of time to run away. You know, I've got a question about this scene. Like, what's the point in any of this? These droids were sent here specifically to recover the map of which there is only one copy. And if there's self-destruct action in here, guys, did you literally just want a big explosion for the hero to run away from? Ah, whatever. So Ahsoka returns to the fleet and meets up with Hera, and the two of them stare at each other in silence for about 10 minutes before Hera explains that Morgan's escaped. And Ahsoka's like, nah, it'll be fine. Also, the map's encrypted, so they need some- Can challenge the very nature of who and what a hero is, and what the audience believes them to be. They can have justifiable motivations and complex personalities all of their own. The best ones can even make the audience question just who exactly the real- Because unlike the hero, writers don't have to worry about making their villains likeable and relatable, so they can afford to take risks with them. They can indulge their wildest writing fantasies, creating the most despicable psychopaths, terrifying monsters, evil dictators, or cunning criminals imaginable. The more evil they are, the bigger the threat they pose, or the harder they test the protagonist, the more satisfying it is when the hero finally prevails. The problem is that good villains seem to be a dying breed these days. The awesome antagonists that used to dominate the screen and push our heroes to the very limits of their endurance are gradually being replaced by weak, Flaccid, forgettable imitations. Wizard of Power is a diverse show. I know this because it's been at the forefront of basically every piece of advertising and marketing that's ever been done for it. But it does create problems that I don't think the showrunners really considered. Like how there's basically nothing to distinguish one human faction from another halfway around the world. Game of Thrones had a vision is that people from certain areas tended to look a certain way, and it helped you to tune into the fictional world that was being presented to you. Here though, any nation or faction can look like basically anything, so none of them have any sense of identity. What exactly does a typical southerner look like? I don't know, because based on what I've seen, they could be Caucasian, African, Middle Eastern, or Asian. How did such a diverse range of different ethnicities end up in such a small, isolated rural settlement? Don't know. It doesn't matter, because this show has to reflect the world we live in today. This show has to reflect the world we live in today. This show has to reflect the world we live in today. This show makes me want to murder myself. Now, it's no secret that Tolkien was a huge fan of allegory and fiction, so truly, he would be absolutely thrilled at what they've done here. Like